Tassa bhago ato arahato sambha sambudasa Namo tassa bhago ato arahato sambha sambudasa Namo tassa bhago ato arahato sambha sambudasa Budang dhammang sanghang namasami There was a teacher named Master Hua who moved from Taiwan in the latter part of the last century to California and gathered a large group of really devoted disciples, founded the City of 10,000 Buddhas, a large monastery in California, and gifted the land that Abhayagiri now sits on. And he was renowned for his wisdom, his teachings. Longpur Sumedho said that he was the one person who ever reminded him of Ajahn Chah. One of my favorite stories about Master Hua and his disciples was that of a disciple he had and at City of 10,000 Buddhas, they're very strict with one meal a day and not eating afternoon. But Arthur had a strong or a uh, large weak spot for pies. And there was a pie shop down the street. And before he'd, uh, I believe before he'd ordained or right after, he would sometimes go down and get a bunch of pies and just eat a lot of pies and kind of have a chance to blow off a little bit of steam. And one day he did this, but he didn't finish all the pies. So he brought one pie back with him and sort of put it in his room. And all afternoon during the meditation, he just kept thinking about, about the pie back and forth until finally after a few hours, he was like, darn it, I'm just going to have the pie. It's afternoon, but I don't care. So in the evening after the meditation had wrapped up, he snuck off to the hidden, most hidden part of the monastery he could find, which was up a roof shaft, uh, up a hatch, and behind one of maybe the air conditioning vents up there where no one ever went. And he had his, had his pie guiltily. And then he heard the roof hatch open behind him. And he thought, who, who could be coming up here at this time and, you know, quickly he, he got up and started walking meditation. And it was Master Hua. And Master Hua started walking meditation beside him. So both were walking back and forth and back and forth until after a few minutes, Master Hua just cracked up and said, was it delicious? <laughs> but I share the story because I think it illustrates just the humanness which and the frailty and the failings which most of us are walking this path with. And we can come to this practice and be so inspired by stories of Longpur Cha, by other teachers we have heard about and read about, by people we meet, and there's just a sense that we fall short. You know, we go on retreat and it's not what we thought it would be. Or if it is once, it's not the next time. And I think all of us would honestly say that we wish we were farther along the path. We wish we were better. We wish we were purer than we are. And often as practice deepens, this ceases to be a deep, sharp self-recrimination and instead settles into this kind of low-level hum in the background of just, my practice is not where I want it to be. I'm not quite there. And it can be a bit like the emperor's new clothes where everyone kind of feels this way but no one really says it. And you hear someone else in a Q&A session mention jhana 
and you're like, oh man, that sounds great. <laughs> Maybe you touch something once and then it's gone. And it can be just this subtle sense of falling short. You know, we have burdens, there's family, there's jobs. Um, we think a lot, our meditations often aren't what we read about. And the sense of frustration and just a low-level disappointment. I think it's really important to note this and to turn towards it and really address it. There's a few ways, I think, of turning towards it. And, and one is to note that we read about these amazing teachers and what we don't see or often forget is all of their histories and that they weren't always like this, that each of them began someplace as flawed and frail as we are. If you believe in previous lifetimes, then sometimes per that, perhaps that's where it was, but often it's just when they were young. Longpur Cha, as a young monk, talked about how sometimes in meditation all he would think about was bananas, and his mouth would just water the whole time. He would sneak off to the noodle shop down the street and tell the noodle shop owner to close up the windows, and he'd have a lot of noodles. He really liked noodles. <laughs> or you hear about... Um, it's interesting, if you read the Vinaya, the monk's code, most of the rules were formulated in response to monks and nuns doing things which are not terribly inspiring. And it's actually quite refreshing to realize that the Sangha, what you hear about is the, often the Arahants, the Anagamis, the great practitioners, Venerable Sariputta, Venerable Mahamogalana, and you don't read about all those who were just trying their best. And some of them didn't attain. Many of them didn't attain. The Buddha says that even if one does not realize awakening, there are the, what he calls the trainee powers, which is something that everyone can have. And this is hiri otapa, so a sense of conscientiousness and concern, um, a sense of kind of moral uprightness, basically. Energy, uh, wisdom, and I think faith is the other. But just he says, if someone has these, they are safe in some measure, that this is at least some measure of, of refuge and something to rejoice in. But what you can read is in the Terigata, the verses of the elder uh, monks and the elder nuns, these verses from the time of the Buddha uh, uttered by disciples, you have uh, stories of, there's one monk, he looked back on his life in robes and felt like he hadn't accomplished anything, and he was going to commit uh, suicide. And right before he kind of prepared the noose, he suddenly had this recollection, my entire holy life, I've held good morality. I've upheld my role as a monk. I've done well. And the sense of goodness and uprightness that came from that brightened his heart, and I believe he attained awakening in the end. There's a story of one monk, uh, or sorry, one layperson named Mahanama, who was worried that at his death he would fall to a low destination. And the Buddha said, do not worry, uh, Maha, Mahanama. Your death will be a good one. Even just as if one throws a pot of ghee into a cool lake, and the pot would break open, and the shards of clay fall to the bottom of the lake while the ghee rose to the top. Even so, if the mind has long been nourished with faith, with energy, with samadhi, with wisdom, with mindfulness, then when this body breaks and is devoured by jackals, the mind will rise. Your death will be a good one, Mahanama. There's another story of Sarakani, and he passed away, and the Buddha declared that he'd been a stream enter. He'd attained, at least perhaps at his death, uh, a level of awakening. 
and all the lay people grumbled about, they said Sarakani was drink. Uh, he went to drink. How could he possibly be a stream enter? Anyone can be a stream enter these days. That's a quote from the suttas. <laughs> and the Buddha said, if one has long gone to refuge in the Buddha, long gone to refuge in the Dhamma, long gone to refuge in the Sangha, then how can they fall into states of woe? Even so with Sarakani the Sakyan, Sarakani accomplished the practice at his death. And then even, he goes on, he says, even if one has not attained and does not have unshakable faith in the Buddha, the Dhamma, the Sangha, does not have vast and joyful wisdom, but if one's mind is established and has been nourished by faith, by energy, by mindfulness, by samadhi, concentration by wisdom. These are the five indriya, the five faculties, a common list. And one feels uh, confidence in the words of the Buddha. Even they would not go to states of woe. No, to say nothing of Sarakani, the Sakyan. Even if one does not have unshakable faith in the Buddha, the Dhamma, the Sangha, and does not have vast or joyful wisdom, but one's heart has been nourished by the five faculties, and one just feels a modicum of, I think it's uh, warmth or endearing feeling towards the Tathagata, even this person would not fall to states of woe. If these saw trees could understand what was well and not well spoken, I would declare them stream enterers. How much more Sarakani the Sakyan? Sarakani the Sakyan accomplished the training at the time of death. So that's always heartening if the trees are in good stead. I think it is important to clarify in this sutta, uh, unshakable confidence in the Buddha and the Dhamma and the Sangha is equated with stream entry. And I think it would be a mistake to understand the sutta as saying that if one has any measure of faith that one has accomplished stream entry or can't fall into lower states. Um, there's a lot of debate. If you want to get monks debating or nuns debating, bring up the sutta and see what happens. Um, but what I think it indicates is it's the Buddha giving us encouragement that the refuges we've come to are not nothing. Maybe we haven't attained jhana. Maybe we haven't attained stream entry. But we don't understand how powerful just holding right view and morality, the five precepts are. This shifts a life. And often we don't see the change ourselves. It's like the light nimitta in meditation. Often people miss it because they're looking for a ball of light. But what it often is is this whole mental landscape brightening slowly in the background. And similarly, sometimes our life, it's not the peak experience that draws our attention and lets us know that we've progressed. It's just that after two or three or four years of practicing, you look back and realize things are just brighter. Maybe you realize the word despair doesn't apply to you in the same way it used to. Maybe you're a little kinder. And when you consider that these habits of suffering we've gone through for lifetimes are so deeply ingrained. I've heard one nun compare it to being in a cesspit trying to clean it out with a toothbrush. This is not small, but we can't measure that progress on the usual x, y axis that we're used to measuring our life and heart by. When we begin to practice, it's as if you open up a z axis and you're moving through this whole new strata of being, and your life can look a lot the same on the outside. The boss is still difficult. You still slip up. You still eat too many noodles some days or pie. But something else is happening in the heart that's profound. And you won't always see it. Sometimes it'll be the people around you that point it out after two or three years. But to really take heart, the Buddha said that even as a carpenter using an ads would not be able to say, today my fingers wore away this much of the handle, and today my fingers wore away this much of the handle. Even so, after years of using it, he would look at the handle and note, notice the imprints of his fingers. Even so, 
one wears away the defilements. So what's so meaningful there is that you don't always see this day to day. What you do is you look back and understand something has shifted. And it's also important to note there that the carpenter's not fixated on making imprints on the handle. They're just going about their work with the sharp end of the ads, of the kind of razor. But this soft thing is happening in the background with their fingers in the wood. And so you go about your life. Sometimes you do it imperfectly. Sometimes there's notes of defilement wound in there. But something's happening to the heart. And Ajahn Suchita says 70 to 80% of the practice at the beginning is just watching the chitta brighten. I know Ajahn Achalo had a very difficult vasa rains retreat at Wat Mopjan, where I ordained. And one day he kind of put his robe over his head and just screamed into it and went up to Ajahn Anand, my teacher, and just said, when will it be any better? And Ajahn, Cha, Ajahn Anand said, in five years, it'll be a little bit better. So at the same time, Ajahn Sona, I know I've quoted this before, but I think it's so important. Ajahn Sona says, after five years of decent practice, you can expect your suffering to have diminished about 50%. And I think both are true. On one level, it seems like things aren't shifting, but on another, they really are. And just to take note of this list we call the 10 paramitas, they mean the perfections. They're not in the suttas, but it's this really common list of qualities of heart. There's dana, giving, morality, renunciation, uh, energy, wisdom, patience, loving kindness, truth, determination, equanimity. But switch those last, the three of the last four, sorry. Um, yeah, truth, determination, loving kindness, equanimity. And often this is how, when you talk to people in Buddhist countries, this is how they frame their practice. I'm building barami, they say. And often that's the case. It's not that every person dedicated to practice in a Buddhist country or Buddhist context thinks they're going to attain awakening in this lifetime. For many of them, that's not even the goal. They're trying to build these qualities of heart. And I think that's a useful list because otherwise we can become so fixated on just how my meditation's progressing. And often for moderns, with our proclivity to thinking and overthinking and re-overthinking and doubting, Ajahn Anand would say that his Western disciples uh, thought about twice as much as his Thai disciples. I think that metric is different now that Western and modern culture is pretty much the same the world over. But compared to a rural society where people grew up with a lot more calm, uh, people raised in a modern context think a lot. But Longpur Cha said, don't despair. You know, it's like you have a big house and it does take a lot longer to clean out, but then you have a big house to wander around in and to live in. And he also said, the reason I teach, I can teach well is because I had so much trouble at the beginning of practice. You read accounts of senior teachers who just sat and immediately dropped into jhana. And often it's hard to learn from them because they just say, well, just bring your mind to Budo. What's so hard about that? And you say, I've, I've literally tried that for five years. <laughs> and so as we struggle with where we are, understand you're developing real skills. And you won't always know it until you try to talk to someone about your meditation. And you realize that each of those impasses you hit gave you some measure of wisdom. But the paramis are useful because it lets us not focus too much on just how the meditation's going. Because these refuges have real effect on the heart. And I've seen both paths work, uh, at work. I've seen practitioners like Long Propasana who, they meditated a lot, but they also lived in the community. They used ritual and the technologies of faith, of chanting, of giving, of morality. And then I've seen people who just go on retreat 
a lot again and again and again and fixate completely on meditation. And I can tell you that when the whole Eightfold Path is brought to bear, there's a synergy that occurs that is profound. And you can have faith that if you're holding good morality, if you're meditating a decent amount every day, if you're holding right view and knowing how to work with suffering with the Four Noble Truths, if you're coming into contact with spiritual community, if you're visiting monasteries, if, you're, if you can, but just as much as you're doing that, something really profound is happening in your heart. And to have faith in that, that's such powerful karma. It can, so much of the bad habits we have get worn away by this, and we underestimate how powerful that is. Ajahn Chah would stress again and again, not the levels of awakening, not states of jhana. He would stress right view and morality. Right view and morality. So the beautiful thing about the Baramis is it gives us this wider metric. Maybe the retreat didn't go well, but you certainly built the Parami of patient endurance. And that's not a consolation prize. The Buddha said patient endurance was the supreme incinerator of defilement. Or maybe you notice that there's a period of in your life where you're caring for your children a lot and you don't have time to sit more than 20 minutes a day. But what about the Barami of giving that you're cultivating of Donna? We have one community member who was interested in ordaining, and he couldn't, um, and had to sort of return um, to care for, you know, uh, a, a child. And he said that his entire practice began became cultivating the first three paramitas almost as a mantra: giving, morality, renunciation. What can I give? How pure can I act? What can I give up? And his entire practice became holding his role as a parent with utter integrity and beauty. And the Barmis let you do that. You can take one for a month or a year, but focus on that. And don't discount that. Often you can put a lot of effort into meditation, but if you're not cultivating these other qualities of heart, it's like a chemical reaction where you have a limiting element. And often the limiting element is another aspect of the path. It's giving, it's community, it's faith. So it's, you shouldn't discount those years where maybe you aren't meditating as much, but you're parenting and giving yourself in that way. All that to say, though, you should still be getting 20 minutes a day. If you can't meditate 20 minutes a day, you've got to be asking yourself, like, really? I can't make that much time? So 20 minutes a day, people. Um, and more is good. I mean, obviously, 45 minutes a day is very powerful, but sometimes that's just not in the cards. And that's okay to have heart that like something profound is happening if you have stepped onto this path and to take note of that and to be forgiving with ourselves where we are as we practice. And more than that, to notice, you know, we hear the analogy of the raft. The Buddha said his teaching was like a raft to go from this shore of samsara to the far shore of Nibbana. And we often think of like a Tom Sawyer-like raft, like really nicely put together with logs. But the Buddha was very clear. It's the person on this shore gathering up sticks and twigs and whatever they can find, pieces of grass, and bundling them together. And then placing the raft just on their belly, paddling with their arms and kicking with their feet. So their limbs are hanging out over the raft. They paddle from this shore to the far. And the two arms, those are the right efforts of cultivating the wholesome and uh, bringing into being the unarisen wholesome. And the feet are kicking the four, two right efforts of abandoning the unwholesome and preventing unarisen, unwholesome states from arising. But it's just enough of a raft to make it across. And that's what we have. Long poor, long Tom Mahabu would say, we think of practice as this staircase up a mountain, but it's much more like we're grabbing at pieces of grass and roots and just dragging ourselves up. And this is what we have. We have these broken personalities, these imperfect lives, uh, the job that's not quite right. 
And that's enough. Whatever your life has given you right now, it can be the perfect place to practice if you really turn towards it with a full heart. And that alchemy, I've never seen a limit to how powerful that motion of heart can be, turning towards where you are and really accepting it and honoring it and having gratitude for it. Can every piece of difficult karma that comes your way be seen not as a retrib retributive fist, but a hand of karma giving you exactly the lesson that you need to learn? Because without dukkha, without these difficulties, even without that subtle sense of dis-ease, how would we ever have motivation to separate out the chitta, the mind and heart, from the conditions it's entwined with? Suffering is the friction that draws the heart away from the substrate of samsara. Otherwise, there's no motivation, and we find ourselves bound into that cloth and our hearts tied to that which is breakable. This is the untying of the heart, and your life is exactly right for it. There's changes we can make, but it begins with a motion of turning towards the conditions you find yourself in now. And Ajahn Suchitta says, personalities don't become enlightened. Chittas become enlightened. Personalities don't become enlightened. Chittas, the mind and heart, become enlightened. And to see that, one of the most profound effacements and humblings of the heart happens with each prog project we have that doesn't quite go like we want it to go, that fails, that there's a deep humility and grace that one can find if one really sees the brokenness of samsara and that things aren't quite right, the wheel's always slightly off kilter, that's one etymology of dukkha, a wheel that's slightly off, and that this is the situation. And to really turn towards that and ask that we become more humble, more caring, and watch as that self, with all of its goals and wants to control and self-recriminations, to have faith that as we practice, a deep transformation is occurring under the surface where the heart is growing brighter and all this crust that accumulated on the top is shedding. And to not overlook that subtle brightening, even if we haven't yet attained a full awakening. So I wish everyone the best on this path and in this. Satu 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 Anu Motami The sutta with the ads is called the Nava Sutta, N-A-V-A, -A, the ship. And there's also this beautiful analogy of a ship steadily fading away on a beach. Um, and even so the defilements are faded away over time or, or disappear over time with the practice. And that's a sutta worth looking up, the ship. So we have a chance for questions. Um, people can raise their hand and we'll run a mic over to you. Uh, or feel free to raise your hand in Zoom if you'd like and we'll call on you. But anything people would like to discuss, we can bring up. Did anyone relate to that talk? Subtle sense of frustration with practice? Okay, I do. <laughs> Can you speak a little bit to the habit of judgment? I 
think the it's such a stubborn and pervasive habit. I find with aversion, which is part of what judgment is, um, it's interesting to note that three of two of the three right intentions under samasankapa have to do with non-aversion. So samasankapa is non is the intention to renunciation, the intention to non-ill will, and the intention of non-harming. And I think it's very significant that the Buddha puts two of them in the realm of non-aversion, because I think it really is where we can reside much of the time. And what I also think that means is that you kind of need a rotating tool belt to address the these deep-rooted tendencies. So for judgment, I mean, one important beginning point is just to have a metta practice in your day. Um, 10 minutes of loving kindness somewhere in your day. Um, it's especially helpful right when you wake up because often your mind will go to the person you're having an argument with. The self will crystallize or try to crystallize around aversion and judgment. And just to note that and really steer the mind right when you wake up towards a wholesome meditation object, a word like love. Just keep the mind corralled very carefully right when you wake up and it'll pay dividends through the day. Judgment, I find, can come up very strongly with the people closest to us, like our family, um, loved ones, because our self is so entwined with them. I find a counterintuitive but really important way of working with our loved ones is actually when developing metta practice to take a step back from them. And instead of thinking of the person as your mom or your dad or your son or your wife or your husband, think of them just as a friend in birth and old age and death in the practice with their own lessons to learn, their own mistakes to make. And I find that that stepping back allows this breath of fresh air where you're really allowing them to be their own person and the judgment fades a bit. I think metta is a bit like a string and if you're too close, sometimes it's slack. But if you pull back a bit, it like can be taut enough to put a really beautiful note. But it's a counterintuitive movement, you know, to step back a little bit. But the self is too entwined sometimes. The other thing to note is that when one begins practice, you're marshalling a lot of constructs of self to steer away from old habits, and there can be quite a lot of judgment at first. And just to acknowledge that's part of it, um, and to just take note and try to let it go when it comes up. Um, but it is part of the process. And to just keep in mind, uh, I think it was Ajahn Chah's admonition that you should be paying attention to yourself, watching yourself 90% of the time and others 10% of the time. To similarly recollect that all the, you know, in the Buddhist view, everything we do that's unskillful is out of ignorance. If someone's behaving in a way that's detrimental, it's because they don't know what's best for their own welfare and they're bringing great suffering to themselves in the long run. It's not helping them. And there's sometimes a route to compassion there. And the Buddha also said that all things converge on feeling. And I think that what that can indicate is if you trace back an unwholesome habit pattern in someone that you're judging, you can find below the initial incarnation of that habit pattern the suffering or vulnerability from which it springs. And this is applying the Four Noble Truths. So can you see the insecurity that's leading someone to always have to be the center of attention? Can you try to understand kind of the root suffering? And that can really undermine judgment too. So these are all just um, little ways, uh, but that's a huge, yeah, there's much more that could be said, but that for now, that might be enough. Is that helpful at all? Oh, uh, person online, you can speak, which person is it? Satcha? Satchan? Hello, Bhante. Go for it. Hello, Ajahn. Ajahn, I am from India. Uh, actually, I have started, uh, started into the practicing meditation, that is loving kindness meditation, through Bhante Vimala Ramsey. 
i am experiencing the benefits of uh, loving kindness meditation really like uh, even uh, recently the uh, talk of ajan brahm i uh, inspired from ajan brahm that daily morning we need to smile ajan brahm used to smile for 2 years in the initial practice just to share this information that uh, smiling makes uh, one's happy even ajan tan says that uh, next moment we don't know what will happen we need to be we need to be happy in this present moment and we should share this happiness and uh, to share this information just i joined and uh, i just subscribe this uh, uh, mountains and i'm happy to hear this talk thank you and wishing you all happiness <laughs> thank you so Keep much smiling. let's get three big sadhus yes. sadhu 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 <laughs> do you remember the uh, specific technique that ajahn brahm used to make himself smile because it's pretty fun the one way pushes is can you do it just yes. to demonstrate yes yes, yes. uh i uh, I, did, <laughs> i did not remember but uh, it it uh, it he says that early morning whenever he wake up wakes up in this beginning of his practice he sees the mirror and sees whether he is smiling or not and he used to practice this for 2 years continuously yes he would uh, put his fingers on the corners of his mouth and make himself smile until he yes. cracked himself up it, it works pretty well actually it, you look pretty goofy yeah. <laughs> thank you it's great to and, meet uh, you and one of my ma- one of my teacher uh, bante mulanam see i think you may be knowing him he has written a book called life is meditation and the meditation is life yes he, he says that life is supposed to be fun like uh, he just tells to relax whatever happening relax and smile yes i no i think it's very important to bring to mind the you know we talk about these lists sometimes and dukkha and all these things but this is supposed to be a path beautiful in the beginning beautiful in the middle beautiful in the end and there should be a sense of nourishment of flourishing of kind of happiness throughout it and if that's lacking if things are too dry we might need to make our lips smile in the morning more so thank you thank you truly thank you thanking you all wishing all happiness okay. thank you <laughs> great <laughs> okay uh do we have another zoom or in person question Oh, one over here. Hi. Uh so I am curious if you have any general counsel in terms of when one's experiencing roadblocks in their practice the balance between diligence in one practice versus you know I've heard rotating tool belt. Um and I'm curious about that personally just cuz I have I have a propensity for trying a lot of different things and then there's other traditions that talk about one strategy and I'm I'm curious if you could shed some light on that. That's a great question. It's interesting because a lot of the meditation traditions that have come to the west on the surface they well on the surface they seem very um open because they don't have all this ritual and you know um costume and statuary but ironically what it has led them to do is have to define themselves by a specific technique and you see this very much in in several of the most prominent strains of western secular buddhism is their identity is predicated on that technique so they're very strict about it and sometimes you can't even go to a retreat unless you're using that technique the irony of the thai forest tradition is on the surface we seem very uh ossified but because the identity of the tradition is embodied in these external elements and in its history the meditation is very fluid and i know monks who you know their practice is recollection of bodhisattvas i know sound of silence um some focus on the breath some uh focus on long rim mom rim um So all to say is that when you hear this is the technique 
stick to it no matter what, you know, just to see if it is originating from that sort of conceit of the Western traditions by necessity to some extent, um, and to be wary of it. Often when we begin to practice, it just takes a while to find a technique which really is onward leading. And it's useful, that initial phase of trying out different techniques, because you do end up with a tool belt. Um, I spent a long time doing death recollection, um, where you just say, life is uncertain, death is certain, or I will die. And I don't use it much anymore. Um, but if my mind's really proliferating, I know I have this very powerful s sword in the tool belt I can just cut things with. Um, so all to say the analogy where you're digging in one place and unless you keep digging in that exact place, you'll never hit water. I just, the one place can be, you know, roughly within the same tradition I think is helpful at first, just so you're not mixing and matching too much. But um, to be willing to experiment a bit, um, you can kind of decide, like, maybe you do want to take on a certain approach for a month or two months or even three months while working with a certain teacher. Um, but also, I've done techniques where you just try it for a week and you it's just not onward leading and you kind of get a feel for it when that's the case. I think the important part is to not enter a meditation with too much fuzziness around what you're doing. And you don't want to be switching again and again within the context of one meditation. like. Set your goal, try it out. And I would use a meditation journal. So after, after a meditation, kind of journal what worked, and then have a little question mark, like next steps. My question is, when the mind is calm, do I let my mind expand to hold the whole body, or do I focus on the nose, or do I focus on the abdomen? And then next meditation, you've got a bit of a road map, a bit more. Um, so wholesome doubt should be kind of systematic and onward leading. Um, additionally, if you really find you're hitting a long roadblock for quite a while, it can be helpful just to read different teachers within the same tradition, but with slightly different angles. And, and that can really freshen things up. So within our tradition, for example, if your breath meditation is at a dead end, try reading Ajahn Suchitta's Breathing Like a Buddha, or Shaila Catherine's Wisdom Wide and Deep, that's Burmese influenced, or Ajahn Brahm. And you'll find each of the teachers, it's the same kind of Theravada angle, but it's just enough different that it can kind of give you a new approach. Um, so yeah, the issue is that if you're getting caught in that unwholesome circling of doubt within the meditation itself, and you don't want to be switching too much, um, but if you, know, you try something for a week or two and it's not working, it's okay to, to switch. And eventually you probably will find what your base practice is, and often it'll be the breath. Um, but then, as to kind of your secondary object, often you can switch it up a bit more. There's more flexibility. So, did that help at all? Yeah, and, and to really take note of that mind state of doubt, it's a hindrance and it's the one that hamstrings us most effectively because every other hindrance we identify as unwholesome. If anger's coming up, we know it's not good. But when doubt comes up in meditation, we can think it's a legitimate part of the meditation. We're like, I just don't know what to do. Is this right? Is it not right? And you can spend your whole sit spinning off. And that buy-in is not helpful. Um, the proper route when that kind of doubt manifests is come back to your home base of meditation. Maybe it's just a simple object. Identify the doubt. And don't try to solve the problem through the doubt. You know, so, yeah. I think we have time for one more question. Mary. Oh, David, please. Oh, thank you. Um, thank you so much, Ajahn. I'm not sure if this is a, a question as maybe just as sadhu, uh, extended sadhu. I really resonated when you talked about the, um, well, I'm paraphrasing it, the obsession with how well I'm doing in my pro program, in my spiritual development, and how easy it is. I just jumped right into this one. I can be incredibly attached to being getting rid of my attachments and very upset and angry at my aversions. And when when I finally notice that, there's this joy of laughter that, oh my gosh, you're taking yourself so seriously again. And when you talk often about the playfulness 
inherent in the possibility of practice you know my my smile comes back without even needing to to do that because i can get serious i can get focused on accomplishing things and it's really it becomes one of these multiple and multiplying hindrance attacks like the um the sorcerer's apprentice when the he keeps chopping up the the um the, the brooms and they keep turning into more and more brooms and at some point if i'm lucky and don't suffer too much in the meantime that moment of oh my gosh how silly this is um you know oh david you're being silly again and uh, my oldest daughter's favorite thing to say to me is oh you silly man and uh, it comes back to me so thank you so much for really that presencing that really important point about progress and not perfection about recognizing that we don't see our own development because it happens gradually uh just delightful thank you so much again sadhu extended sadhu thank you david there's a type of wisdom uh, the Buddha talks about called laughing wisdom, hasa panya. Hasa means laugh. It sounds like laughing. That's a beautiful term to have in the practice. Um, and Ajahn Jayasaro, when we asked him, I think it was Mark that asked him what the most important quality he saw in people remaining in robes was, he said, a sense of humor. So I think that's exactly, exactly right. We should um, probably wrap things up.